Dr. Atkin, first of all, what do you think the effect of climate change, which seems to be happening across the world, is going to have on agriculture and our ability to feed a population that could reach 9 billion by 2020? Well, there's no question that agriculture does contribute to uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, estimates are in the range of 25 to 33 percent if you include deforestation. So it's, it clearly does contribute something. Uh, but we get a lot for it. We're feeding 6.5 billion people. Uh, we need to feed 9 billion by 2050, which is going to mean a doubling of, of food production when you factor in the better diets people will want. So I, I see this as, uh, as a success story, but um, as part of a solution to, uh, to climate change. So if we, can, if we can still produce the food and do it for less greenhouse gas emission, that would be the, uh, that would be the answer. But uh, pre presumably genetic modification is essential here if uh, we're going to be able to feed the world. Well, there are a few things that, that we can do. The first thing I think we can say pretty clearly is that we don't need to chop down any more trees. Um, the productivity increases we've seen over the last 40 years have not come out of uh, more land coming into production. They've come mainly out of getting more out of existing land. So it's to do with uh, technology, better seeds, better plant nutrition, improved um, crop protection uh, technology. And this is what's uh, driven yields. So we can see that, I think, very clearly. Um, it's intensive agriculture that we need, but we can do it in a more sustainable way. But intensive agriculture is very uh, heavy on land, and we are now seeing cases of land grabbing by governments buying up in, in, in cheaper countries. I mean, how, how big a worry is that? Because we need a lot of land to feed a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, uh, we need a lot of land to, to feed a lot of people. You're right, but the land that we have is going to be adequate. And I think, if I come back to your earlier point, um, we need all the tools at our disposal, and this will include genetically uh, modified crops. I mean, there are 134 million of uh, hectares grown uh, in the world. Um, it's one big experiment if, we, uh, if we're still not convinced about it. Uh, 14 million farmers are and, and it does deliver benefits. It delivers uh, more efficiently produced food. It's not so visible to consumers of course but uh, it does deliver benefits and, 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 and you know the evidence, all the evidence suggests it's uh, absolutely a, a, an important tool and the science says it's, it's fine. Well, um, what's the significance of the fact that after a 12-year gap, really, the Commission has now approved the Amflora potato as a, a first yeah. step, if you like, this BASF potato for producing industrial starch? Yeah, I mean, that's a good move. We, we, uh, we welcome that. It's been a long time coming. Um, if that is going to pave the way for more uh, scientific uh, evaluations which, which get agreed and, and passed into uh, product registrations, then, then we would welcome that. It's a step in the right direction. A couple of years ago, though, the EU only had, what was it, 1% of uh, the, the overall global land under genetically modified crops, compared with something like 54% in the United States. I mean, Europe's got a lot of catching up to do, hasn't it? Well, it, it does, and we're, we're back to the earlier point about if we want to get the most out of our existing land, we do need to have all the tools at our disposition. And then the, you know, the, the point about so-called land grabs and, and other factors would become less important. We do have enough land to... Uh, to do this, we do. Even, even under climate change, I mean, we're, we're hearing of desertification well, and also land going under the sea, perhaps, if sea levels rise. I mean, of course, if, if we have dramatic climate change, then that would have an impact. That, that's very clear. But um, there is a real possibility that agriculture could become carbon neutral by 2030, um, based on some of the points that I've, that I've raised. No more trees to be chopped down, uh, doing sensible things, combining um, agronomic and biological, uh, uh, organic, if you like, farming techniques with intensive ones, sustainable uh, intensive production. There's a lot of things that can be done and, uh, you know, we sh I think we should be overall optimistic about both producing food and, and reducing uh, greenhouse gas output. You say the potential's there, but it does take political will, political decision to be taken. Politicians often think short term rather than long. Yeah, that's right. I mean, awareness, uh, awareness is critical. First of all, do we, do we all agree that uh, uh, these things that we've discussed can be done? Secondly, conviction that doing it in the way I suggest, which is intensive but sustainable, is, is the right step. And then finally, putting that into action, you know, enabling technology to be available, um, making sure that every farm's a business, farmers have to make money, making sure that that happens. I mean, these are all uh, important steps.